Because the devil has sifted you and found your weakness. What you don't know, you that live the common life, getting up in the morning, turning on your radio, turning on your hi-fi, turning on your TV, eating your bacon and eggs, going out to work or to hang out on the corner, you ain't no problem for white people. They got you. You at the TV, eating ignorance. You sitting around listening to foolishness. The devil ain't got the plot on you. He got you. But the smarter ones among you, those that show signs of leadership, he's always watching for them, male and female. And he's sifting you. He'll call you up. Find out what you want. What do you want out of life? Man, sister that's just looking at TV. Brother, this out there selling drugs. What, what do you want? Well, I just want a Cadillac. Well, hell, that ain't no big thing. Nigga just sell this crack. I'll see that you get a Cadillac. You want it with gold appointments on it, nigga? I'll put some gold appointments on it for you. What else you want, nigga? Well, I want a big gold chain, and I want, I want to treat my head in this. And it got to be with, with a lot of thick, you know, you're a thick one. He said, oh, nigga, that ain't nothing. I got your nigga brothers in South Africa digging gold out the, out the mine. I can get you a gold chain if that's all you want. You want money? You want money? I print it every day. I print some just for you, nigga. Go ahead. That's what you want? I got it. You want to be a big nigga, don't you? Yeah, I know you. You want to be a senator. You want to be a congressman, huh? You want to be a district attorney. I got it. Nigga, you want to be president? I can make you that. Whatever you want, baby, I got it. Whatever you want. <laughs> but before I give you what you want, you got to give me what I want. I want you to bow down your principles you noble fool I'll give you what you want but you gotta give me what I want and most of us have sold our souls for nothing but a little position and some money so you can wear a fine suit ride in a fine car Sell out your brother, your sister, lie in court to get out of trouble yourself so that some of your brothers can go to jail to do big time. You ain't no problem. But it's the man that got principles. It's the woman that says, I'm not going to bend. It's the preacher that says, I'm God's servant. And Satan said, yeah, I'm going to see. And God never holds the devil back from trying the best of his servants. So don't nobody here think that because you stand up and confess how much you love Allah and love God, and love the kingdom that Satan is not going to try you. He said, Peter, the devil desires you that he may sift you as wheat.
Adversity is the mother of creativity. The life of ease is something that we should guard against. That's right. I'm going to say it again. The life of ease is something that we should guard against because when you have money, you have a degree of ease and then sometimes you begin to lose the creativity that you had, the, the, the drive that you had when you were poor and struggling. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. Out of the suffering of our fathers, came spirituals. Deep River. My home is over Jordan. I want to cross over into campground. They were wise. They were rapping then. They were sending little messages in the spiritual. You better steal away. That's right. You can't walk away, you can't run away. Steal away. Yes. <laughs> steal away to Zion. You gotta steal away. Steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. That's right, See, they, they, they were understanding this thing. Mm. But they couldn't openly say it. That's right. White folks in church talking about Jesus and black folk in the field saying everybody talking about heaven ain't going to heaven heaven yeah. message they were rapping but since the slave master loved to hear us sing we put a little stuff in the song adversity became the mother of creativity Swing low, sweet chariot. Come in to carry me home. I want to go home. That's right. You understand? Yes, sir. Out of our suffering came blues. Out of our suffering came jazz. That's right. Out of our suffering came what they call R and B. That's right. Out of our longing for God to deliver us came gospel. Yes, sir. But none of that before we were suffering. That's right. Think over that. <coughs> and out of the suffering in the ghetto came rap. That's right. The suffering of your people produced you. And now you can live from those that produced you. But that should make you a servant of those that produced you. That should make you a servant of the hood. Because the hood produced you. Hard times produce you. The whizzing of guns and bullets produce you. Death and destruction of your homies produce you. For what? Just to talk about it? Or to change that reality into something better? That's your challenge, brothers and sisters. began to unite our struggle all over the world. Now, many of us may not see the value of language in conveying ideas, but the enemy knows that if you shift your language, you may shift your focus, then he can redivide what had been united. When we saw ourselves as black, not Georgia, not Mississippian, not New Yorkers, 
We were black folk catching hell in America. But when we saw our brother from Haiti, who was victimized by the French, so he had a French name and a French language, or we saw our brother in Santo Domingo speaking Spanish, we knew he was black and he was our brother even though he spoke Spanish, another one spoke French, another one spoke Dutch, another one spoke some European language, but our blackness made us one people. 80 million of us in Brazil who speak Portuguese, but we would not let the language or culture of European colonizers divide us one from another. So all Africa was ours. All the Caribbean, Central, South America, the Isles of the Pacific, we saw ourselves not as a minority, but we outnumbered white people when we thought of ourselves as black people first, we outnumbered them 11 to one on our planet. So they became the minority, and we were the majority, uniting for our liberation. Now, Martin is gone, Malcolm gone, Elijah gone, and a shift in language. In this city of Baltimore, there was a television show called Black Star. In New York, there was black news. There was black journal. In every city in America, there was a TV show with the adjective black describing some aspect of that show. But all of a sudden, when the leadership was gone and their ranks confused and civil rights movement got us integrated into something, that was diametrically opposed to what we really need. While we were celebrating being allowed to go into white hotels, white motels, white restaurants, we began losing what we had built as a result of segregation. But not only were we losing economically, we were losing the struggle. Shifting language. All of a sudden, we recognize, the enemy recognized when Dr. King was assassinated and a hundred cities were set on fire. He said, who led this? Somebody must lead these Negroes for them to burn a hundred cities. Who gave the order? And what they recognized was every night on the nightly news, we were watching and what had happened we were becoming a nation without ever realizing what constitutes a nation Ooh. because nations start with similar uh, attitudes and out of those attitudes comes a system of belief and out of that system of belief comes ideology. Then a national community evolves out of that. But what was shaping our attitude? We all had a common attitude toward the government. A common attitude toward racist police. Because they were whipping us on television every night. We saw the fire hoses, the dogs. Huh? We saw our people being beat down, so we had an automatic attitude toward white people. We knew in the 60s who our enemy was, but today we don't know that anymore. Shift in language. They said, it's this TV that's uniting these Negroes. Let's see if we can shift this. So Black Journal, a national, a national TV show, became Tony's Journal. And Black was dropped. Black Star was dropped. Black News was dropped. Huh? Just see the shift now in language. You're not talking black no more. You are the minority, the disadvantaged then you became African-Americans. 
Well, when you become an African American, how does that connect you to your African brother in Haiti or your people in Grenada or your people in Trinidad or in Panama? See, the shift in language began to deteriorate the spirit that made us all see ourselves as one dynamic people suffering from a common enemy who inflicted us with a common disease. Give you a ham sandwich and <laughs> fix you up. Give you a loan. Give you a little loan at the bank and tell you how they really with you. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the boys at the top. And that's why the Bible said we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness that's up in high places see they already know that if they keep you asleep white supremacy can continue to rule and they will remain subhuman you gonna you, you gotta listen to what I said so. they will remain subhuman the Bible calls the rulers of this world under the name beasts. Four great beasts from Revelation and the book of Daniel. Go back and look at it. To call a human a beast means that they have not evolved yet. To become a human being, they stop at the level of a beast starting in the Genesis as a snake growing into a dragon and a beast in Revelation and they become the teachers so the Bible said the mark of the beast was in our forehead and in our hands. Walk the streets and see if you don't see bestiality. How could you drive by and shoot? The gun may be defective and they bring stuff in your community that ain't right so you can't shoot straight. But you think you got protection, you shooting at this man end up killing a baby over here. That's bestiality, brother. What mark is in your head where an old man can go to the grocery store and you see him coming out with his groceries hobbling? You don't offer to help him to his car. You beat him down and you take his money. And he asks you, why are you doing this to me? Lou Palmer, a black man who stood in this city, was on the radio preaching to us to make us a better, more conscious people. And in his old age, he walks the street and a young man came up and tried to rob him and knocked him down. And he said, but I'm Lou Palmer. Nigga, I don't give a damn who you are. What kind of mark? is in your forehead what kind of mark is in your hands you're worse than a dog because a dog will protect its young go around the female dog when she has her pups she don't know you see a growl and don't come too close because in the nature of life she will protect the young. But look at you. Look at you. You bring a strange man in the house while your young daughters are growing up, coming into puberty. That wicked-minded man is romancing you, and as he's dancing with you, he's looking at your daughter. 
you got to go to work while that man sits around looking at the TV. Mm. Mm. And your fine looking daughter whose breasts are bigger than yours and she's 11 and 12 years old because she's loving it. Eating at McDonald's and eating at Wendy's and eating at Pepe's and eating in all these fast food joints. It tastes good. But what's happening to your child? Some of you older people in here, you had your cycle at 12, 13, and 14. Now these children are having their cycle at nine years old with a Barbie doll in one hand and a maxi pad in another. No, know how to protect themselves and you are not there to protect them. Most of our women have been abused by our uncle, our father, grandfather, cousin, brother. There's no sanctity here for young girls. And sometimes the mother is so damn weak that even when the daughter would tell her what the man did, she'll make excuses for the man. You've lost your sense of protection. And the man don't give a damn about protecting you no more. He don't have it in him no more. He's become a beast in human form. Or what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad called a savage that has lost the knowledge of himself and is living the life of a beast. Now when a woman thinks that the beauty of her face and the beauty of her body is what is so much of an attraction to a real man, then she must display herself because she wants a real man in her life. Nothing wrong with that desire, sister. That's a good desire to want a real man in your life, but you got to know what a real man is. <laughs> So now you say, well, man, I got that, you know. So you notice how y'all watch each other? Sisters. <laughs> you see a woman walking. The man didn't spot her first. You did. And she's so tight. And her stuff is so wrong right. <laughs> Till you try to make conversation with him to keep his mind somewhere. <laughs> so he won't see something that naturally appeals to the eye of a natural man. But if you and our women out there didn't think so much on the outer beauty and started realizing where real beauty is. See, beauty is not spelled B-O-O-T-Y. And so when you get it all twisted, then you think that's booty is beauty. So you don't work to cultivate the real beauty that is a woman. And when God created woman, he knew what he was doing. He gave her all of that all right. These are her adornments. That's what the Quran calls your breasts. We don't have them, except you want some. <laughs> I'm 
now, sisters, <laughs> if he want to take hormone treatment, he can develop some. But these are adornments. Your hips, they are adornments of the beauty of a female body. So the Quran says, no, you cover your adornments. Why? Because when you adorn yourself, see the adornment is the attractive feature. So if you attract a man to your bosom, so we get these, you know, brassiers that really make them stand up and out, you know, <laughs> in your face. Is this subject teach? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to degenerate the subject matter. I'm talking about a war that we need to win and our women are our co-warriors in this war against Satan. Now, sisters, I was with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at the Syria Mosque in Pittsburgh in 1957, and he took a sister out of the audience who had a short dress, and he called the Muslim sister up who was dressed like this sister and stood them side by side. And he said, this woman had the short dress. She is a member of the righteous just like this woman. Yes. Not that this woman dressed in this white garment here is better than this woman in the short dress. But he asked the question, if these two women were walking the street and a drunk wanted to act the fool, which one would he talk to? Would he talk to this one in a long dress? He ain't seeing nothing but the beauty of her face and here come one showing him the beauty of her body he ain't talking to the woman that's covered he's looking at that woman said, oh. and he drunk and he could do it sober hey baby man you sure look good to me see and that feeds a silly woman's ego because you look good to him for him to destroy you you're too precious for that. Once you make a stand for what is right, you must be willing to suffer at the hands of the enemy of right, but you will be the winner. See, I already know that we are the winner. I can't take sides with the enemy of what is right for my people even if I die in the struggle because life is meant for a purpose we are born to die it's just how you die and for what reason you die that makes your living and your dying worthwhile so if you fear reprisal for standing up for right you're not a good leader for your people you got to be willing to walk behind the master teacher the master revolutionary and he said if any man would be my disciple he must first deny himself then pick up whose cross? Say it again. His cross. Not Jesus' cross. Not Muhammad's cross. Your cross. Because there's always a cross when you stand up for right in a world as wrong as this is. But you got to be willing to pay the price to free your people. Otherwise, you're not akin to the ancestors who died to give us this time today. See? So you're in the valley of decision now. Some of us going to punk out. Oh, yeah. It's always somebody that got an excuse. 
but then you'll be seen. Especially when you look in the mirror and you'll be seen by others as one who failed the test. But if you had unity, if you had unity, you would not suffer. And believe me, we stand up for what is right together, they'll bow down. And if they can make you afraid, then you bow down. But when you are in unity, you see fear come into them. And you get your way. Now here's the consequence of step number two. See, what rap has done or hip hop has done it has put us in a light where now we are killing each other and the enemy is planning to kill us all I'm going to say it again we are actually living in the valley of the shadow of death now if we keep killing each other with our beefs we're, we're uh, uh, operating on such a low level that you're going to smoke your brother over some little beef and here God has come to put you on top and you are killing the people of God and you don't think there's a consequence for that? And what is the consequence? The Bible says that those who did not want to follow Moses and Aaron and rebelled against their guidance, they were bitten by fiery serpents. And right now the enemy in all these armories has built up weapons. Um, armored personnel carriers. Please listen. They're changing the highways now, particularly around urban centers, so that tanks can roll. The same thing you see in Israel, among the Palestinians, where they have nothing but helicopter gunships, jet planes, high-powered weapons against people with nothing. So the enemy has given us a chance to get a little weapon. And we're killing each other with it. But soon, he's coming. And soon, he'll be killing us wholesale. We can stop it. But if we continue on this path of promoting the killing of one another, then God himself will chastise us with a chastisement that was never seen in the annals of the history of prophets. Now you either will come up right or you will answer with your life. I'm not talking just to be talking, I know it's on the way. And if you open your eyes, you can see the enemy already. He don't care nothing about you marching in Jenna. He done put the boy back in jail to show you he don't care nothing about what you do. It's getting to the point where it's either throwdown time and you are the one to wake your people up and unite them. And God will defend and protect us. But we're going to have to be willing to pay the price that every oppressed people pay when they really want to be free. Damn it. And that's the question. Do you really want to be free? Or do you want to leave another generation? To still fight the same enemy that we are fighting today that our fathers fought yesterday and our grandfathers fought the year before. We cannot afford to lose another generation hoping that white folk are going to treat us better. Right. 
look into Washington. If we are not in unity, we can't force the Justice Department to do right by us. So we're going to have to unite and be willing to pay the price to be free. It's better to be dead than to live like we're living. You don't have any life. Look at your people. A beautiful young black girl in West Virginia. But it's because of us that don't love and respect our women enough that a white man could do that to a black woman and expect nothing in return. Go ahead, man. No people allow their women to be hurt and they don't come back with something. What kind of men have we become? And as long as your woman is a bitch and a whore in your mind, you'll never stand up for her. And if you won't stand up for her and the children that she produces for us, it is better that we be dead. And soon you will be. We got to stand up. Because the rich don't want to change. The rich like things exactly as they are. So that the rich can continue to get richer on the backs of the poor. No, no, no. No. I registered today. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh -oh. For the express purpose of changing that reality. And now let me draw this talk to a close. Voting should be along lines of our self interest. Yes. Now, now. Go ahead. And every human being that is a part of the American body politic must know its own self-interest. You do not vote for people who are against your self-interest. But how do you know what is your self-interest? Self-interest is based on self-knowledge. And if you are deprived of self-knowledge, then giving you the right to vote and not a knowledge of yourself and what is in your best interest is to take the vote from you and misuse you in the process. And that is what has happened. We have a lot of wonderful elected officials. I mean, they're full of wonder. We... Sometimes we wonder what they're doing. <laughs> and that is because we send them and don't challenge them to be responsive to the community that voted for them. I did not register to vote to be one of those kind of voters. We must ensure that we know the voting record of everyone that we send and those that we don't send that we can use our power to sit down and set up. In other words, today, Father's Day, is the end of Uncle Tom handkerchief head black politics. So once we know that you don't vote your self-interest, your community interest, then we know what to do with you. You will not use our vote and then play ball behind the door with our enemies. You will not do that anymore. 
Now, you know, there was a recent article in Newsweek magazine called The Browning of America. I don't think it had anything to do with an x lax commercial, but I rather think I rather think it had something to do with the fact that people of color, demographically speaking, are growing in numbers and in a democracy where there is one vote, one person, then that should send a signal that power is shifting in America to brown people. So they are working night and day to give you the right to vote but to keep you confused so that power doesn't shift as the population shifts as our eminent um, jurist Dr. Uh, Eugene Pincham, Judge Pincham, informed us. So now our duty is to register every unregistered person, but then the duty comes to educate our people as to what is their self-interest. And in the educational process, then you will begin to see transformation of power. And so I will conclude with Father, a message to the fathers. I think the message to fathers is best stated by Jesus in a Christian context, dear Muslims. When they said to Jesus, Master, teach us how to pray. He said, pray on this wise. Our Father. Not mine and not yours. Not yours and not mine. See, because if he's a father of all, then he don't have a special pick that he gives something to and takes something from. He gives to all of his children according to their needs. Our Father, which art in heaven. Every father should be in an exalted place and state among his own family. Our Father, which art, which exists in an exalted state, not Father, oh, that so-and-so, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> that no good chunk, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I ain't paying that. Uh -uh -uh. Yeah. All fathers must work under God's guidance. Because if God does not become the father of your actions and your words and your deeds and you become imbued with the wisdom of the eternal father, then you cannot be a good father to your children. So you will never reach the exalted state that God intended for a father. In my house, my children hold me in an exalted state. In my house. Hallowed be thy name. Hallow means that your name, Father, should be sacred in your house. Mine is sacred in my house. Because I acknowledge in my life the eternal God to give me guidance for my children and for my household. Therefore, my name is hallowed in my house. Thy kingdom come. See, every father is a man over a kingdom under the king. As a Muslim, we say, Oh Allah, thou art the king. But every father should be a king in his own house. But thy kingdom 
Come. I mean, you can't be a father with no vision, no aim of kingdom, of building something for your family. Thy kingdom come. Me, bring it into existence. Father, thy will be done. See, in my house, under the eternal God, my will rules my house. They say, Farrakhan, what do you mean by that? I mean, as long as my will is thy will, then God's will is preeminent in my home. Thy will be done. Where? On earth, in my house, in your house, in our houses, even as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. See, every father has to provide on a daily basis the daily bread for his family, which is their prayer. And lead us not into temptation. See, when a father is not really on his job, when he doesn't provide and protect and secure his family, he's helping to lead the children to be tempted by what's outside. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, every father has to teach in his home that the siblings have to learn how to be forgiving to one another as we seek forgiveness from God for our trespasses. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever. But no man can really be a father without the ability to provide. But even though we didn't have a lot of money, we had a lot of life experience in a hostile environment. So when we were allowed to become or to try to become fathers, we had to say things to our children to protect them from the wickedness of our slave masters and their children. The old parents had discipline. They lived in poor environs, but they somehow had a cohesion that we don't have today. We could always go to grandma's knee while grandpa was in the field, and grandma always had some wise saying to tell us. She didn't have book learning. She didn't know anything about a BS or BA or MS or MA. She just had life experience and mother wit and whatever she had, she would give us counsel and guidance. And long after grandma is gone, Think back on grandma and look at the wise sins. When grandpa would come in from the field, ma would have the kettle on, the biscuits, you could smell them. <laughs> House filled with the aroma of food. You remember? Some of you never even had a grandma or grandpa like that. 
but the older ones of us remember this grandma didn't have money but grandma had a whole lot of love grandpa didn't have any money grandpa had a whole lot of discipline now grandpa definitely was the disciplinarian when grandpa came in the stick came in with grandpa and grandpa grandpa could never be called a child abuser because he tanned the fanny with love in other words he beat the hell out of you but make something out of you and you wouldn't even think to go to some authority and tell the authority that your parents had abused you why you would get a whooping from everybody in the community in those days we were poor we didn't have automobiles we didn't have telephones. We didn't have television. We were lucky to have a radio. But somehow we had a sense of community. When I went out in the street, my mother's eyes were the neighbor's eyes. And I used to cuss a lot. And when I got out of my mother's I sighted and was with the boys and I was cussing and sneaking a cigarette or trying to get a little drink or something. The neighbor was looking out the window. Is that you? Boy, I'm going to tell your mother. But before she sent me to my mother, I would get slapped up. Then when I got home, it was hell to tell the priest, man. I needed somebody to give me last rites. So you had to be careful how you acted at home, and you had to be careful how you acted abroad. But there is no such thing today. My mother would take me to school walk up in the principal's office this is my son and I've taught him manners but if he gets out of line I want you to take care of it and call me and let me know and I will take care of it again But she was the first one to school when I made a complaint about some racist remarks that the white teacher would make. Mom was right there. My son told me you said such and such and so and so in the class. Is that so? I didn't have a father. I didn't know my father. My mother was my father and my mother. It's a heck of a burden to put on a woman. That she's got to be both mama and daddy. But because I didn't know my father, the men in the church looked after me. Not only the women looked at me, but the men. But in truth, the men didn't look after me like the women did. Men still were kind of weak. And that's why I left the church. There was nothing wrong with Jesus. But something was wrong with the way religion was being practiced when it came to the liberation of our people 
It was when I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that I found the Father that I had been looking for all my life. I found a man who loved me more than I loved myself. I found a man that took a child disconnected from God and reconnected me with God. I found a man that not only set my life in a new motion but gave me a law to discipline and bring the motion of my life under divine order. And I do not care, brother, what you call yourself. But when you generate life or business or family or anything that you put into motion, it is your responsibility to bring it under order by creating or using a law to discipline whatever you bring into existence. Elijah Muhammad loved us and therefore love was the generating power that furthered my life. Father, F-A-T-H-E-R, Father, F-A-R-T-H-E-R. -E, he threw the ball farther or further than I threw it. Well, that's what father means. When you are able to father life, you are able to further your life by putting something here that by right should live longer than you and extend your life into a time period that you and I will be unable to see. A father furthers life. A father generates life into the future. But we not just to generate the physical. We are to generate the vision. Generate the idea. So that your sons and your daughters will not only pick up the life that you gave them. But pick up the vision. Pick up the ideas. Pick up the principles. So that whatever they build, the children will build upon it in the name of their father. Lead us on the right path. God's responsibility to his creatures is that they're guided by instinct or by knowledge to the path that leads them to success in their evolutionary development. So it is a part of the nature of God to guide man aright. What is your responsibility as a father? To guide your family to the right path. How can you guide somebody to the right path and you don't know where it is? <laughs> Have you ever chosen a guide to take you someplace and you ask them, well, where is it? I, I don't know. <laughs> but that's a heck of a guide, isn't it? <laughs> now, the children shouldn't have to tell you what your duty is. They came from you. Your duty is to guide your family. As a father to the right path the path that will bring them into favor with God that's your job as a father guide your wife guide your children guide whatever you are involved in 
to a righteous path that brings that family, that community, that organization into the favor of God. The path of those upon whom God has bestowed his favors and not the path of those upon whom wrath is brought down nor of those who go astray. Meaning what? A father has to be observant and point out to his children. See that brother there? Now that brother is on the wrong path. Look at him. He's banging needles. He's nodding. Well, you know he ain't guided it right. So you're trying to guide your children not in a path that leads to self-destruction. You got to know those who go astray and keep your family from the path of those that go astray to earn the wrath of God. That's your duty as a father, but it's also your duty as a mother. Now that's the oft-repeated prayer of the Muslims. Now look, there's no prophet, sage, or wise man that I've read in the Bible or Holy Quran that referred to God under the name Father. The only one that ever said that was who? Jesus. Now Jesus had a father, boy. How do you know he had a good father? I mean, that's not to take anything away from his mother. She was great, wasn't she? But she didn't make Jesus. She made a body. She made a flesh form. She taught him and nurtured him. But there was another force, another power that operated on Jesus that he called Father. And that power that operated on Jesus nurtured him. Look, didn't make life easy for him. See, a father is not necessarily supposed to make life easy for you. Some of you think that a good father is he who showers you with everything you want. That's the worst kind of father you could have. But you never had no father like that because your father couldn't give you hardly nothing. So in that sense, you ain't had a bad father. Now, he couldn't give you the things that you wanted. Look at the way God nurtured Jesus. He gave him tools and then he allowed him to be tested by Satan. He didn't say don't test him, he's mine. He said put it on him Satan, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, lay it on him. Now which one of you fathers knowingly would lay on your children a test to prove your child's acceptance of your discipline and your training. See, most fathers don't think like that. But where Jesus was concerned, God thought like that. <clears throat> Here's a man that was nurtured from a child and then he goes all the way up to sit at the right hand, according to the Bible, of his father. Then the father loves him so. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How many fathers can actually say that? You know, I got a son and in him I am well pleased. But God said that of Jesus, right? This is my son. I'm well pleased with him. Why are you pleased with him? Because he's so obedient. He don't say my will. He says God's will. Every father loves an obedient child. The child that catches the most hell with a good father is a rebellious child. Even with a good mother, 
the thing that you work hardest with is when you got a child that you can't tell nothing. Do they try your patience or what? Try your love or what? Sometimes you just get to the point where you just give up. Say the heck with this. Gone. And whatever you get, that's what you earn. Get out of here. You know what's lacking in most fathers and most mothers? You're very weak. And a weak mother and a weak father can never produce a strong child. I'm going to say it again because, you know, wait, 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 wait. I want you to listen to me good because, see, a father, in order to guide the child, there has to be a rod and a staff. Uh oh. Wait, wait. I'm going to go over that again. You tell all your children, I want you to get down on your knees, say your prayers before you go to bed. Now be good. I want you to say the 23rd Psalm. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Look here, brothers, sisters. You are so weak today. You're making terrible children. Because you're too weak to discipline them. You say you love your children, you're a liar. You love yourself. And you want your children to love you, but you don't want to act like a real parent. You think there's something wrong with busting your child's behind. And if somebody else busts your child's butt, who told you? You ain't got no bit hitting on my child. The behind is made of a pretty good uh, substance. It'll hold up. A behind will hold up. Try it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I beat the hell out of mine. My mother didn't spare no rod where I was concerned. I was scared of that woman. I didn't have no father, so she had to be both, and she was good being both. She stepped in, and I mean, I'm talking about a woman that didn't take no foolishness. You can't be the woman that God want and be some old weak jive time mother that is afraid of your own damn children and won't discipline your children. You're the teacher, woman. Then damn it, get busy and start teaching. But how can they know except they have a teacher? And many of you are so ignorant. Nobody has taught you. So you don't really know how to teach your own children. And you refuse to get in a class where you can be taught. You know how to paint your face and your lips and make yourself sweet upper and lower. But I'd be damned if you know what to do for a child and what to do for a man. You don't know and you refuse to be taught. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the love of God? Yes, what is 
the beginning of wisdom. It is the fear of God. Why should wisdom start with fear and not love? See, love is not as constant as fear. When you're afraid of something, you stay that way. When you love something, you love it today, don't love it tomorrow. But what you're afraid of, damn it, you're afraid of it today, afraid of it tomorrow, afraid of it the next day. I, I, I don't want my children to be afraid of me. That's wrong that the children should be free. That's why you ain't got nothing good. But the white man made a good nigga out of you. He, I say it again, he made a good nigga out of you because he made you scared of him and you're afraid of him right to this moment. We have it, we have it in our lessons. He put fear in them when they were little babies. Why do they fear now that they're big men? Because he taught them to eat the wrong kind of food. It is only when fear is present that you can train a child. Not when love is present, but when fear is present. These so-called masters of training can train a lion to act like a pussy cat. Train a big elephant to sit around and roll around on the damn ball. Train whales and seal and don't know how to train a human being. Excuse me. Let me tell you something. When the white man wanted to make you a nigger, he knew he had to put fear in you for him. And after he made us afraid, he could train us to be his boys. And right now, you are afraid to disobey him. You don't care nothing about God. Because your God is the white man. Most of you are like that. If you're not like that, son, you come into the world at a different time and got a different idea in your head because somebody been teaching you. But the, the majority of our people, they're scared. Scared to think like men. Scared to walk like a man. Scared to want to take control like a man. The only person you can beat is your woman. And now she's losing fear and beating the hell out of you. Even to this moment, you talk God, but you fear. White folks censure and disapproval of you from the top all the way down. It is not white people. It is your fear, your inordinate fear of them that keeps you bound. How dare you? 30 years or more in your independence still bowing to the queen.
making a big error. You still got a massa? She's on your money. Her image is everywhere. To remind you, don't get too uppity, Mr. Nigger. You're still my slave. Your education control from there. Even religion has to be taught a certain way. Otherwise, you're not accepted. See, the Rastafari got a free black mind, and that's why they don't like Rasta. for true mental liberation in the Caribbean. Whether you like it or not, that is a fact. I don't wear my natty dread. But my natty dread is in my tongue. disrespectful of the queen but the queen must not be a reminder to us of our days of colonial servitude to Britain we must cut every vestige that reminds us of our slave past and we must ascend to our free present. Listen. When we were enslaved under Europeans, the black man had to be destroyed. Sisters, I want you to understand the degree of destruction to the black male. And brothers, I want you to understand why it is that even in the economy of the islands, you still don't wield the economic power even though you are the majority. We do not mind, listen, we do not mind the Indian businessman, the Arab businessman, the Chinese businessman, that's fine, because that's Jamaica. That's what makes up Jamaica. But if it's a true democracy, the majority must be reflected not only in government, but in the power of control of resources that make politics free. Whether you believe it or not, you are very precious. 
in the sight of Allah. You, you don't think that much of yourself. But Allah sees in you what he created in you that is good for the world. He has a purpose for your suffering. And he has a purpose for your life. Your people, your ancestors, that endured the cruel torture of being caught and enslaved in Africa, then put in the dungeons that we saw in Ghana, in the Cape Coast, and in Senegal. If you just walk in those dungeons where our fathers were packed, you, you can feel the anguish of our ancestors, brothers. And then to pack them in the holes of ships like sardines in a can, urinating and defecating on themselves, disease spreading and they dying in their filth. And then some, rather than come to America to be made slaves, jump into the ocean to be eaten by sharks. And the strongest of the strong survived the middle passage only to come to America or the Caribbean and to be stripped of what made you who and what you are. All of you are Muslims. Wait. All of you are born in the nature of submission to the will of God. You can call yourself whatever you want to call you. God says you are the righteous. You are born to submit your will to do the will of God. And when our fathers were brought here, many of them were Muslims. They understood Arabic. They knew their Quran. They loved Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the enemy who had fought them in the Crusades and lost and knew that these Muslims ruled the world from the 7th to the 11th century. And they did not want Islam in this new territory. So they had to strip us of our names, our language, our culture, our religion, our God, our history. And they made it us and took the children away from the parents so that we could grow up having highs but not being able to see having ears but not being able to hear having a tongue not being able to speak your language so you grew up in America blind deaf and dumb to who you are. And the Quran says, surely the vilest of beasts are the deaf and the dumb. So putting us in that condition and in that position was to ensure that we would forever be their tools and their slaves. It was forbidden for you to know who you are. Nobody was allowed to teach you what would connect you again 
to your father and your culture, your religion and your God and yourself. So all your life you have been admiring the Caucasian and hating yourself. So why is God angry with you? Because in the 60s you traded Negro to see yourself as a black man no matter what the color of your skin was. And that appellation of black connected you to people of color all over the earth and then you knew that you were not the minority you were in fact the majority of the people on the earth now check this out then you started calling each other brother that was only done in some religious circles but now when we met each other in the 60s how you doing brother there was a sense of connection we were so getting so connected that when you saw the suffering of your brothers in Alabama you felt it in Chicago we felt it in New York and in Newark and in Cleveland and in Los Angeles and in Houston because we were being connected through a word that gave us a nervous system that made us a one body of people but the enemy saw that and anytime the nerve is severed you lose feeling how could you brother go to an elderly woman snatch her pocketbook beat her down how could we go in Rosa Parks house and beat that woman down how could we meet Lou Palmer and beat him down in the street. Tell it, tell and when he said, look, son, I'm Lou, Power, uh, Lou Palmer. I don't give a F who you are. What kind of coldness have come over you that the life of your own flesh and blood means nothing? So every time you kill a black man, that God intends to save. You are increasing God's anger with you. Now this is uh, a warning. And I'm going to put it out and do with it what you want. He said because you loved the shedding of blood. He would give you your own blood to drink. And you will be drunk with your own blood as with sweet wine. Now you look over in Palestine. You see the Palestinians with their AK-47s. Right? They come out in the street and they shoot their weapons in the air. But the Israelis are not dealing with AK-47s. They got helicopter gunships and jet planes. And they have these guided bombs and rockets from drones. And nobody flying but somebody with a, 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 with a computer is sending rockets to kill leadership. Just two nights ago, they dropped a 500-pound bomb on a house that they say some insurgents, uh, they thought, were in the house. And they say they killed five, but the, one of the Arabs that was uh, uh, left alive, he said 14 were killed, most of them children. Here's a man that's so cowardly, he's not going to go knock on the door to find the insurgent. He's going to stay in the air and drop a 500-pound bomb. 
See, these are cowardly people, man. But theirs is coming, and so is yours, unless you make a right decision. Surely man is in loss by the time. Abraham Lincoln believed that as long as we were present in America, we could never hope for social equality and that blacks suffer from being in America and whites suffer from our very presence. And therefore, Mr. Lincoln felt that the two people, black and white, should be separated. His first White House conference with black leaders was based on the question of separation. Mr. Lincoln desired that blacks be resettled either in Africa or in Central America. Mr. Lincoln felt that if we returned to Africa with the knowledge that we had gained from our sojourn in America, we could be a blessing to the entire continent of Africa. That's what Mr. Lincoln felt. Now many black leaders have emerged since then to offer solutions. Booker T. Washington believed that blacks should be trained to develop skills and trades that we might drop our buckets down where we are. W.E.B. Du Bois believed in the talented 10th concept that black people should develop skills in science and literature, mathematics and language. So among these two arose a great debate. And later came the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey developed the strongest mass movement of black people in our history. And his cry was Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. Mr. Garvey desired to see blacks return to Africa. Then came the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my leader, teacher, and guide who advocated that blacks should be separated in a state or territory of our own either here or elsewhere and that America should take care of us in that separate state or territory for the next 20 to 25 years until we were able to go for ourselves. Now, since we have reached the time in history that we must make an exodus Brothers and sisters, it is important that we know what kind of exodus we must make. We have got to come out of the values, the norms, the way. That's not hate. But you just must not be a carbon copy of your slave master anymore. In order to be respected, you must be yourself. Listen. Can't you see, brothers and sisters, that God is gradually bringing us out from under the authority of our former slave masters and their children? This is manifested in our babies' unwillingness to go along with their teachers of education, religion, politics, and law. Why is it that no matter what you do, you can't seem to get control of the young black minds? The young blacks cannot be controlled by education and politics and religion so drugs is flooding the black community to keep the young black mind in check huh? look at it we see a breakdown of order and discipline in the schools in the homes in the church in the society this is because it is time that black people come out from under white authority now, 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 listen to me. Listen. It's not hate. You just are not a slave anymore. So you must stop thinking and acting like an inferior person. Hear me well. Listen. We have got to come out 
of the spirit of depending on others to do for us what we must do for ourselves. You cannot say you're a free man and then do not want the responsibility of freedom. You can't say you're equal to white people and they're feeding us, clothing us, sheltering us, making jobs for us. You can't go around saying to them, you, you, you white people don't give us a good image on the television. Uh, 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 I don't like the way you portray us. You should be recognizing that they are not going to portray you. You must portray yourself in a better light. That's your responsibility and not theirs. Now look, we must recognize that God is after us today to build a new kind of world, a new kind of society. So God himself is breaking the ties that bind you to your slave master. They say Farrakhan is preaching divisiveness. No, I'm people that black people must do for themselves. You don't like that because you always want to see black people groveling at your feet. Now, if you want to stay at the feet of white people, brothers and sisters, that's up to you. But I can tell you, you will be a loser all the way down the line. Your children will rise up and condemn you. You must get up from the foot of your master and say, I am a free man. I will take my life into my own hands. You must do this. Now. We're the only ones who really, in my opinion, from the very beginning of the idea of reparations, are the ones who ought to be addressed. I'm talking about African Americans. We can't even seemingly move that out of the Congress. No, it's, it, I don't think it, it might have been in committee, but never got out of Right, it's in committee. committee. They haven't, right, it's in Tanya's committee. He's the chairman of the judiciary. America does not wish to discuss repair of black people. Members of the Jewish community who became rich and powerful over what was done to us. They don't want to talk about mm -hmm. repair, but I want to suggest this to you. It's a wonderful way to repair your damaged relationship with the Lord of the worlds. What he's asking to save yourself, to help him save us. So here's a government that is experiencing the throes of divine judgment and her fall from power. This is real. So for us to get around talking about inclusion in this system, don't even think like that. This system is dead. You don't need to be included in a dead educational system, a dying political system, an economic system that's about to crash. What do you want inclusion in that for? So the Bible says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. We have the ability now to form something new in education, something new and better in governance, something new and better in jurisprudence, something new and better where more people can benefit. That's what the kingdom of God on earth is to be about and whether you want to accept it or not black people in America you are chosen to be the cornerstone of that kingdom therefore all your efforts to try to be a part of this that is dying will get you killed come on out of her and let's build something that the whole world can benefit from well stated What was wrong with the elders? See, the elders were shaped by Pharaoh. That was the problem. Pharaoh made them just like himself. That's why when Moses came, he had to tell them, 
thou shalt not steal. Come on now. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your name. You must honor your mother and your father. And the Lord your God is one. Don't set up any graven image or likeness, nor bow down to that. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's ox, his whatever. Don't covet. Well, a man got to tell you not to do these things. Evidently, the people were doing it. So Pharaoh had the people all messed up. That's so God had to make a break between the elders and the young so that he could teach the young because the young were fearless. The young were strong. The elders wouldn't even go into the promised land. Moses uh, was told, uh, say, go on in, uh, send uh, the Joshua and the spies out, let them see what's going on over there. And they came back and said, Lord, there's giants over there. We can't do nothing with them giants. And God said, go ahead in. I'm with you. I'll help you to overcome those giants. And they said, no, no, we ain't going for that one. You go in there and clean them giants out. Then we'll go in. So the God said, okay, I don't need no people like this. I'm trying to show them that I'm with them. So I'm going to let these that are afraid of Pharaoh and afraid of giants, I'm going to let them die out. But them young ones that are unafraid, Joshua, bring Caleb. Come on, boy. You take them young people and go on in to the promised land. Now check this out. See, Jesus had the same problem. See, the disciples, they, they like money sometimes, you know. But they didn't want to pay no attention to the young. So some of them were, were, you know, rebuking the young. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Don't do that. Don't, don't rebuke them. Bring them to me. For of such is the kingdom of God. Then he told the parents except you become as a little child you can't enter why why must we elders become like children because the white man shaped us and he didn't shape us for liberation he shaped us for service to him perpetually and in order to break that cycle in the church we gotta come out of the mind that the slave master made and that's why paul said be ye not Conform to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewal of your mind. So a nigga in the church and a nigga in the mosque and a nigga in the synagogue is a nigga right on. So we don't want to be Negroes, niggas, and colored people. We want to be what God created us to be. I don't mean to be raw like that. I don't mean to be raw like that, but young people, don't let nobody make you ashamed that you are black. When you wake up in the morning, you see your beautiful black face, look in that mirror and say, not mirror, mirror on the wall, I'm the prettiest of them all. And say, mirror, mirror on the wall, I'm black and I'll be standing tall. Because you are the original people of our planet. You got to know that. You got to believe that. Now, based on that belief, you get an attitude. You know, I got a new attitude. I don't mean the way you fix your hair or the way you droop your pants. A new attitude means a new orientation of mind that whatever I sit down to do, I can master this. How dare you tell me I can't master mathematics when I am mathematics? When you see Michael Jordan coming down the floor, what's this? 
you see that brother pass through the other brother's leg and it's done so majestically and then they rise and fly in the air and then dunk. That ain't nothing but mathematics, brother. How many beats does your heart beat per minute in order for you to be normal? What is your blood pressure in order for it to be normal? What is your pulse rate and your temperature in order for you to be normal? You are a mathematical creation. Therefore, mathematics is at the root of you. It's at the root of the universe. And you are created by God to master yourself and master what he created. Therefore, don't run from mathematics. Run to it. I am history. How are you history, Farrakhan? Because I come from that which is past me. I live now in the present. And I got a sperm that can produce the future. So don't tell me I can't master the principles of history when I in my person am the past, the present, and the future. In my genetic coding is all my ancestry. I am the past. I am the present. I am the future. Therefore, I can master history. What about physics? What about chemistry? What about science? Not to think about singing and dancing and all that. We got that part. <laughs> and, and, and you do that so well. It's the other part we need to get now. Because your father was a builder of civilization. And you can't sit around here in these crazy looking houses in Harlem. And look at them. I'm glad to have one of them, if I had one. But I believe we could build something better. I believe if the creative juices started flowing, we could build something better than this. But we have to own it first, then tear it down. And put our own creativity in architectural design to work. Oh, the future is great yes, for sir. you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Future is great. Let me conclude by saying to our young people, look, never be disrespectful of your mother or your father, even if you see they wrapped up in Pharaoh. But you have to look for teachers That's right. who can give you a new vision. Yes. 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 That's why as young people, see, if you go to public school, all of that's fine. <clears throat> but when you come out of there, you got to get a book by Dr. Yusuf Benyakinen. You have to get a book by John Henry Clark. You have to get a book by J.A. Rogers. You have to learn that the, the historian from Washington that passed away, Chancellor Williams. See, the, uh, 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 Dioff, Sheikh Anta Dioff. See, these are people that have gone outside the box. And if you don't want to be boxed into white supremacy, you got to read those who went outside the box. And when you read those that went outside the box, you'll get out. You'll get out. And when you get out, you'll find that you're like a lion that's been in a cage. And you're walking back and forth in that cage. You can't get out because you haven't found the door yet. But the master said, I am the door. You want to come out and enter in, you got to come by me. All of that has meaning today. The wisdom of Jesus, the wisdom of Moses, the wisdom of Muhammad, the wisdom of Abraham, the wisdom of God is available to us as a doorway out of walking back and forth.
in a slow pace, but Lord, when you wake up and find the door and bust out, nothing will ever contain you again. This is no little lightweight city. No, sir. You not no little lightweight group of black people. That's for sure. You're powerful. Yes, sir. You just don't know yourself. You want to get in touch with the God of yourself and realize that we together can make things happen. We can't sit at home and wait for a mystery God. No, no. Will you sit up home and wait for a mystery God to no, bring you sir. bread? No. How many of you believe that God is real? Very good. Now you sit home tonight, hungry. <laughs> Saying, God, I know you're real. Lord, send me some bread. I know you's able, Lord. Send me some bread. Lord, I know you never left your servants alone. Send me some bread. Lord, all the ancient ones prayed to you and you didn't leave them without bread. Lord, give me this day my daily bread. You keep sitting there praying. See, will the bread come down? You'll be a starved, emaciated, praying fool. And they will bury you in a praying position looking for bread. Rigor mortis will sit in and you'll be in the casket. Honorable Elijah Muhammad said no, emphatically no. We don't believe in no mystery God. Whatever we want to happen, we will it. We go to work on it. We produce it. We make it happen. Be. And it is in the beginning was the word. That's what we've got to do as a people. Any sister in here who's worth anything. She don't see a fine looking man of substance and say, I wish, I hope, I pray. She wishes, she hopes, she prays, and she go to what? Right? Right, brothers? Non-productive people are not respected. We must produce. So I'm going to stay here in Chicago and study and prepare and give direction first to economic development and educational development. Reagan opened the door. Believe me, you don't think that Reverend Jackson and I are going to be together? Are you kidding? We together now? Don't you know all the people that attack me, we together? Because we don't have any place to go. Now look. We got a black man in this city. We're not in control of the city council, but we got some good men there. That's for sure. We need to take advantage of this and become what? Productive. We don't want a community filled with crime. We can't thrive with a crime community. Can we? No, sir. We can't thrive with a dope-filled community, can we? No, sir. We must end crime and end dope. And we must put our young people to work with real money and substance in their hand. Our young people are powerful. They need to be shown how to take over their community. Not talk about turf, take it over. Own the turf. Run the turf. Nice to see you break dancing. I mean, you learn how to contort, you know. <laughs> I 
I mean, I watch my little grandsons and I don't understand how they do this thing, you know? I said, this is the new dance. Man, twist his head up like this. He get out and spin on his elbow. Arch his back and spin all around. I said, now that's work. But it doesn't produce the thing that we want. Break dance in your spare time. Let's take over our communities in our full time. There's nothing wrong with that, brothers and sisters. We're not planning against white people or against the government. We're planning for ourselves and our people. We must take over and control where we live. We must become producers. We must run our turf. We must have a say-so over where we live. You go in any white neighborhood, young white boys group together with young white boys. That's the nature of young men. And young men are impressed with physical exploits. So in white neighborhoods, city councils have all kinds of playgrounds for them. Basketball league, junior baseball league, police athletic leagues. You work off your aggressions, you see, in sports and they turn the aggression into something healthy. In the black community, man, we ain't got no playgrounds. The brothers are playing on lots. They clean the, the garbage away and put a little basketball net up and, you know, that's pitiful. So those that don't get involved in that and don't get involved in boxing, they still got that macho thing as little young men. So we young men hang out with young men. We group together in our little uh, corner of the ghetto where we live. And then we don't like the brothers that live over in that ghetto. Corner of the ghetto. What you doing over here? <laughs> so it becomes aggressive. And then we fight each other. That's what we did when we grew up. But now it's difficult because there's guns involved, there's drugs involved. It gets real complicated now. But it's really not the fault of the youth, it's the fault of those who are the stewards of that energy. We have failed our young people. Yes, sir. We intellectuals, we the parents, have failed to provide a future for our children. We're sitting around waiting for white folk to provide a future for us and we have not done our job to provide a future for ourselves. It is not for white people to provide a future for black people. It is for black people to provide a future for themselves. And as long as you sit around waiting for government to do for you what you could unite and do for yourself, then you'll always come up wanting. Come now we're going to deal with solutions. The gangs are being fed guns and drugs. And there's only one organization left now that really speaks to the needs of black people. I think the Detroit Free Press did a survey or whatever they did. And uh, I got a letter from a reporter from the Detroit Free Press and they said that 42% I believe or more of the black people that they polled said that the Nation of Islam seemed to have the solutions to the problems of black people. Newsweek magazine said that Farrakhan had from 26 to 32 percent of the black people with him. That's a sizable number. If the Detroit Free Press did their poll and between 40 and 50 percent of black people see the Nation of Islam as some sort of solution and Jews don't like Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and maybe the government, and not maybe, the government doesn't like Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. 
Now, don't you know that your rise has been the greatest fear? And any leader that can arise to attract masses of black people, they're terrified of such a man, particularly if they don't control him. So now the government has to move to destroy me and the nation of Islam. I mean, these are young men that Allah blessed me to call out of the world and out of the filth and the garbage that they were involved in. And they've cleaned up their lives to try to make something out of themselves. Imagine a million like this. Imagine two million like this. Imagine five million like this. You understand? Now when you begin to think numbers, you think like white people who are in power. See, and we've done something to these blacks. And we know that they don't like us. And if the niggas ever get strong, they're going to try to do to us what we did to them. Wait, wait, wait. This is the way they think. And it's written in the Bible. Pharaoh was frightened. He saw the children of Israel multiplying. And he said, come, let's deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, join on to an enemy, and come against us. So their plan was to kill all male children of the children of Israel. The Jews understand this history. And you notice the black male is being done in. The poor sisters almost are hopeless in terms of finding a black man that will be a true mate to them. It's really sad. The black male is going. You visit all the college campuses, you see black females in preponderance. Black females in law, black females in medicine, black females in engineering, black females in science, but the black male, he's in basketball. He's in track. He's in football with, a, with his major in black studies and psychology. Please, that stuff don't work on babies today that you call psychology. All right. The black male now is being decimated. Here comes Louis Farrakhan. I'm not a big man. I'm not a muscular fella. At least I wasn't. I'm just a little fella with a trumpet. And evidently my people are listening. Now, white folks say, we got to stop it. Because he riles up those niggers. So how are you going to stop me? What did you plan to do? Very quickly. You know, when my brother Malcolm X was alive, White folks didn't like him. And there's no sense in you thinking that now that he's dead, they like him anymore. But Malcolm's legacy stands. They don't have one living leader to pit against me. They tried it with Reverend Jackson. And they tried it with, I'm telling you the truth. And it didn't work. So what you gonna do with me now? The IRS is busy working. Can we get him on tax? My friends in the Justice Department and the FBI, they have a hundred man squad that watches Farcon. Farcon watches. <laughs> It 
There's a scripture in the Bible. They wanted to take Jesus, but they feared the people. That's right. You wise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but see, black folk know that I'm just about the last one that they got. That's right. And black folk know that the government don't like me. And if I just fall and hit my toe, they're going to blame the government for it. That's right. That's right. And only God knows what's going to happen after that. But even if they don't rise, I'm telling you straight up, when Bush comes against me, God will move on Bush. Watch what I tell you. When the government, when y'all get tired of hearing me, and you think that you got power to destroy me, then come on and watch my God tear your behind to pieces. You can't be in America like this without a God. And I'm not talking about your God. I'm talking about my God. That's right. Come on, That's right. That's right. Just like the Jews could talk about the God of Israel. I'm talking about the God of the nation of Islam. That's right. That's right. And he's not no spook. He's not no spirit. He's a real live man. But he got power over everything. Now you mess with us and see. We don't carry no weapons. We don't need no weapons. God is our rock. He's a living God, a real God. The God that the scripture said would come in the last day. He's walking with us. He's present among us. He's backing me up. Otherwise, I'd have been a dead man a long time ago. You say, Farrakhan, are you threatening us? Yes, I'm threatening you. I'm saying if you want to live, leave me alone. If you want to die, then come after me and sentence your children and your children's children to death. You kill your last prophet. Right. Come on, sir. You won't kill this one. Right. Say, you a prophet, I'm more than a prophet. Oh, a prophet can't handle this work. This work is too big for prophets. Come on. This is a work for God. Right. This is the day of the Messiah. Oh, this is when God is not to come. He's present in human beings, working through human beings for the benefit of human beings. And I'm one of those human beings in whom God is alive and active and working.